I'm Jessica. And I'm Josh. Welcome to The Branch. We're so glad you're here today. And we would love to know that you joined us today. So you can go to the app and hit check in. Also, if you came prepared to give today, you can do that on The Branch app as well. Or you can place your offering in the box at the back of the room. And if you're curious about what is going on at The Branch, there is a button on The Branch app for that called What's Happening. And there you can see all kinds of events like Starting Point. If you're new to the branch or maybe you've been here a while and you're just wondering like how to get plugged in and what's your next step, where do you start? Well, starting point is for you. Our next one is going to be happening on Sunday, February 4th during our 1045 service. And you can register and get more information for that on the branch app. And our annual branch youth Galentine's and Palentine's events are coming up March 1st and 2nd. It's on the same date, but it's different places. We've got Galentine's for the girls and Palentine's for the boys. You can find more information for that on the Branch app. You can register there as well. And Princess Ball is back coming up February 2nd at our Farmer's Branch campus. Dads, this is your chance to take your daughter on a date, take her to dinner, and then bring her to the Farmer's Branch campus on February 2nd for a night full of dancing and dessert. It's gonna be a whole lot of fun. It's $25 per family. Go to the Branch app, register today. We'll see you there. And we're continuing our series through the story and you can find sermon notes for that on the Branch app. Again, we're so glad that you're with us today. Welcome to the Branch. After Joseph and his brothers died, the population of Israelites living in Egypt exploded. It grew so large that the new Pharaoh was fearful that they would form an army against Egypt. So he made the Israelites slaves, forcing them to make bricks all day long. Then Pharaoh took it a step further. He issued a ruling that all newborn Hebrew boys should be killed. Soon after that, an Israelite woman gave birth to a son. Fearful he would be killed, she put him in a basket and placed him in the Nile River. The basket floated downstream and was found by Pharaoh's daughter. She raised the boy in Pharaoh's palace as if he were her own child. She named him Moses. Years later, Moses saw an Egyptian beating an Israelite slave. Moses became angry and murdered the Egyptian. Fearing for his own life, Moses fled into the wilderness where he became a shepherd. One day while he was tending his flock, he saw something incredible. A bush that was engulfed in flames but was not burning up. Then Moses heard God's voice coming from the bush. God had seen the suffering of the Israelites and wanted Moses to lead the people out of Egypt. So Moses went back to Egypt and met with Pharaoh. He asked that the Israelites be given a short break from their labor to hold a festival to worship God. Pharaoh not only denied the request, but made the Israelites work even more difficult to punish them. But this was just the beginning. To prove that God was on Israel's side, God brought great disasters called plagues on Egypt. God made all the water of Egypt turn into blood, filled the land with frogs and insects, sent diseases to kill the Egyptian animals, gave the people terrible sores, and brought terrible thunderstorms and terrifying darkness. Then God sent one final plague. God protected the Israelites by giving instructions to each family to take a perfect sheep, sacrifice it, and put its blood on the door frames of their houses. The Israelites did what God commanded. At midnight, God moved throughout Egypt and every firstborn son, including Pharaoh's, were killed. But God passed over every house that had blood on its doorframe. Pharaoh was so overwhelmed that he practically begged the Israelites to leave. So in the middle of the night, after living there for 430 years, the Israelites left Egypt. 
However, Pharaoh once again changed his mind and sent his armies after the Israelites. They chased them for miles until finally they trapped the Israelites at the edge of the Red Sea. But God instructed Moses to strike the water with his walking stick. When he did, a strong wind blew across the sea, creating dry land for the Israelites to walk across. After they reached the other side, God caused the water to crash back down, drowning all of the Egyptians who were following close behind. The Israelites journeyed far away from Egypt. Along the way, God took care of them, giving them quail in the evenings and flaky bread called manna in the mornings. Many times the Israelites complained about their living conditions, but Moses would remind them of God's goodness and continue to lead them toward the land God had promised them. So that's it. That's the sermon. Oh, you wish. I know you wish. If you're here for the very first time, we are in the midst of a series called The Story in which we are walking through the story that Scripture tells from Genesis through Revelation, and we're using a reading plan called The Story. How many of you have your story books with you right now? Can I get an amen? Oh, there's still time to repent and bring it next week with you. All that we're holding in our hand is just a way of reading through Genesis through Revelation. We've been in chapter four of the story this past week, which is the first half of the book of Exodus. And I showed you the summary video just now, just to give you a chance to hop aboard if you're new here or if you read it last Monday and you needed to be refreshed as to uh, where we've been this week. There are two big ideas in the really the first half of the book of Exodus that's told in chapter four of the story, the text of Exodus that you're reading. Uh, and the two big ideas revolve around deliverance in many respects. There are two big stories of deliverance in this part of Exodus. The first is the story of Moses' deliverance. The second is the story of Israel's deliverance, the nation of Israel. But we're gonna begin with Moses right now because before Israel could be delivered, Moses had to be delivered. And how Exodus sets the stage uh, really sets the stage for the deliverance of Moses. Exodus opens by telling you that the population of the Israelite community has grown greatly in the land of Egypt. And a lot of you remember how they got to Egypt from last week's readings. They wound up there many years earlier decades earlier, looking for food because of a global famine. And Joseph, one of their own, was second in command at Egypt. We saw that incredible story last week. And under his leadership, he actually saved Egypt and the nations around it from a famine. But there's that chilling line you read in Exodus chapter 1 and verse 5, which you saw this past week. It's on page 43 of the story where we see then a new king to whom Joseph meant nothing came to power in Egypt. And this is how Exodus opens. Genesis closes with Joseph being, in many respects, the hero in Egypt. Exodus opens with this recognition that a new king of Egypt comes along who does not remember Joseph. How quickly we can be forgotten. I mean, Nick Saban and Bill Belichick gone in the same week, and everybody is on with it to the next ones. The other day, my sons were in shock when they found out Troy Aikman was once played quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> How quickly we forget. Though Egypt has all the money, all the technology, all the weaponry, this new Pharaoh is getting anxious because the Israelites are populating all of Egypt. And he's getting anxious that if they ever organize, they could revolt in our country. So he decides to institute a form of birth control. You'll see this. He attempts to wear them out. Ever so slowly, they've gone from working for Egypt to becoming enslaved to the Egyptians. And he attempts to wear them out, to work them so hard that they would have little energy to do anything else because it takes energy to make babies. Some of you can't believe I just said that. 
And some of you know that because we're in the middle of a baby blessing weekends over a couple of weekends at the branch. We have some people who have some energy apparently, at least nine months ago. But it, here's the deal. Pharaoh knew that if they're worn out, it might impact the birth rate. And, but more than that, it might discourage the Israelites from ever thinking about bringing children into this kind of life in Egypt. It doesn't work, though. The Israelites keep having babies. Why? Because as you've seen the last couple of weeks, God has promised Abraham that his descendants would be as the sand on the seashore or the stars in the sky. Pharaoh doesn't know it, but he's fighting against God. And the Israelites just keep multiplying. So Pharaoh moves from birth control just to straight genocide. He gives orders to wipe out all the Hebrew baby boys by throwing them in the Nile. And here you arrive at the story of Moses. Chapter 4 tells the story of Moses' deliverance from an early death. That's the first thing he's delivered from. And of all things, uh, babies are to be thrown into the Nile to be killed, but he's put in the Nile to be saved. A Hebrew mama hides her baby boy and actually saves him by putting him in a basket, hiding him along the banks of the Nile, and as the providence of God would have it, the baby is discovered by Pharaoh's daughter. And her compassion gets the best of her when she sees him. And of all things, Pharaoh's daughter, an Egyptian, is the one that names him Moses. And the reason she names him Moses is because that was a name that had to do with being drawn out of the water, and that's where she found him. Moses would go up to grow up as part of the Egyptian royal family, as Pharaoh's daughter's son. Moses' deliverance came from an incredibly unlikely place. But after growing up in Egypt, Moses does something terrible one day. He sees an Egyptian beating one of his own people, a Hebrew, and Moses kills the Egyptian and tries to bury the body. He attempts to hide the evidence, but uh, it doesn't work. Some Hebrews saw what Moses did and threw it back in his face later. So then he takes off. He's a fugitive on the run. He leaves the area. He makes a home in another land. He finds a wife named Zipporah. He has a family, and he becomes a shepherd for 40 years He's a shepherd out in the wilderness minding his business when God interrupts him at the age of 80. You're thinking, hey, I ought to be done. Moses is just getting started. God calls to him through the burning bush. He tells Moses, hey, I've heard the cry of the Israelites and their slavery. I want to deliver them from Egypt, and Moses, you're the man to do it. And Moses basically says, no way, Jose. It turns out some of Moses' initial objections to God's call are the same objections that a lot of people have given God down through history, which leads me to the second thing Moses needed deliverance from, a spirit of self-reliance. That's another theme here. And it may be a strange way to put it when you consider that Moses' resistance to God's call has to do with the sense of his inadequacy. But here's the deal. When you are excessively preoccupied with your inadequacy. It is a form of self-reliance in the sense that all you're doing is keeping your focus on yourself and your limitations and what you can't do. Moses' sense of inadequacy is tied up in a couple things. The first of which is his lack of credibility. And so Moses says to God in Exodus 3 and verse 11, this is on page 48 of 46 of the story, he says to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? and bring the Israelites out of Egypt. Who am I? Moses is concerned with his credibility. The last time he was in Egypt, he left as a fugitive. Who's gonna follow him? Another concern that Moses has is his lack of capability. Moses says to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord. I've never been eloquent, neither in the past, watch this, nor since you've spoken to your servant. In other words, God, I'm not getting any more eloquent even in this moment talking to you. I'm slow of speech and of tongue. In other words, I've never been a good speaker, and by the way, God, I'm not getting any better even though I'm in your presence. And as the story then develops, you find Moses practically begging God to send someone else to do it. You ever done that to God? 
There's a lot of times when our feelings of inadequacy, they lead to a refusal to accept responsibility. In fact, it's hilarious to read the conversation because the way Moses talks to God, it's as though he's trying to enlighten God. You ever tried to pray that way? A lot of us do pray that way. We try to enlighten God. I used to sit through prayers growing up about being with Sister So-and-so down at Seton Hospital who's in room 348 fighting a case of, and they're informing God from the pulpit as to what's going on. It's so interesting. Moses goes about it like he's trying to enlighten God. It reminds me of the old saying that everybody wants to serve God. It's just in an advisory capacity. And this is probably why God gets so frustrated with Moses. Do you know what a cold call is? Some of you have had to do cold calls. Maybe you're doing cold calls right now where you make a call to someone in order to sell them something or invite them to something or to to ask them to do something. You don't know a thing about them. I want to tell you what. God doesn't do cold calls. He knows who he's calling. He knows Moses doesn't have the credibility. He knows Moses doesn't have the capability. In fact, do you know what God does? Notice what he does. He doesn't call Moses to believe more in, in himself. He doesn't say, now Moses... You need to believe more in yourself. That's not what he does. He calls Moses to believe in him. He tells Moses his name, I am. Moses is saying, who am I? I am not. God's saying, but I am. In other words, Moses, I'm everything you're not. And I'm with you. God doesn't call people on a mission and then abandon them. God says, I'm going to help you to speak, Moses. I'm going to teach you what to say. And I'm even going to raise up your brother Aaron to be a mouthpiece for you. That's kind of the rest of that part of the story. Moses needed to be delivered from a spirit of self-reliance. He was so focused on his own limitations, he tried to hang up on the call of God. Makes me think of a doctor by the name of Bill Cook. He works in southeast Texas, but he did his residency in Memphis, Tennessee, And when he was going about his residency one day in Memphis, he was unexpectedly called to an operating room and he scrubbed up and he found his place at the operating table and the lead surgeon appeared and explained they were about to do an appendectomy and then he handed Dr. Cook the scalpel. And Dr. Cook just had this panicked look on his face and he quickly explained He's never done this kind of procedure before. And the legendary surgeon said, well, today is your day to learn how to do an appendectomy. And you're going to begin. That's why you have the scalpel. And this legendary surgeon who had this reputation for training doctors by by throwing them in the deep end, he cocked his head back and said, relax, son. There's nothing you can do here that I can't fix. Dr. Cook found security in knowing there was one in the room greater than him. God's answer to Moses, the question, who am I? God's answer is, I am for everything you're not. And I want you to focus on me, the I am who will be with you. I love what Charles Spurgeon said in the 19th century about Moses. He spent the first 40 years of his life in Egyptian royalty thinking he was somebody. He spent the next 40 years of his life in a desert thinking he was nobody. He spent the last 40 years learning what God could do with somebody who thought he was a nobody. And God's still doing it with people today. Well, there's more that can be said about Moses' story. But let's move on to the story of Israel's deliverance. Chapter 4 tells the story of Israel's deliverance from Egyptian bondage. I think it's interesting that Egypt had once been used to save the Israelites, and yet now it's enslaving the Israelites. It just goes to show you how quickly one generation solution can become another generation's problem. In other words, that which can be used to bless you at one point in your life can quickly be used to enslave you at another point in your life. Another thing is this. It takes slavery 
to compel the Israelites to want to leave Egypt. Did you notice that part of the story? Egypt had been their salvation at one time. They were living in the best part of Egypt and they settled there. That's how Genesis closes. But it isn't until things turn sour that they begin to cry out to God for deliverance. And ultimately that's a good thing because they were never meant to settle in Egypt for good. If you remember in Genesis, they were never meant to settle in Egypt. But they settled there. God had promised his ancestor, the, their ancestor Abraham that they'd have a land of their own, but they settled in Egypt. And here's the deal. It took misery to prompt them to want to move forward into the purposes of God. Can you relate? Have you ever settled for something less than what God was calling you to because you were comfortable, but it took misery to make you want to move forward again? Misery can do a lot. To get somebody moving again in the right direction. The Israelites have been crying out for deliverance and God acts. And it's how God acts that leads to the second observation about their deliverance. Chapter 4 tells the story of the Israelites' deliverance from trusting in anything other than the Lord himself. This is the story of God delivering Israel from trusting in anything other than the Lord himself. This has everything to do with how God chose to deliver the Israelites. When Moses confronts Pharaoh about letting the Israelites go free, Pharaoh asks a question that frames the context for the whole story of the plagues. Exodus 5 and verse 2. Moses comes before Pharaoh and Pharaoh says, Who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. Now, Pharaoh is, in a sense, right when he says, who is the Lord? He doesn't know the Lord, but he's about to find out through a 10-plague correspondence course. The Egyptian had as many as 80 major gods that they worshipped. These 80 gods were clustered around three major forces in Egypt, the Nile River, the land, and the sky. The pharaohs were this human connection between the gods and the Egyptians. In fact, the pharaohs were seen as a mini-god that worked with the gods in the Egyptian realm of the heavens to keep harmony and life running smoothly in Egypt. And the idea was as the Egyptians keep honoring pharaoh and all these gods, then their quality of life will be blessed accordingly. So what does God do? God begins to unravel life in Egypt as they know it from right underneath their feet. God starts messing with the three forces, the Nile, the land, and the sky. Watch this. God dismantles creation right underneath Pharaoh's feet, and everything gets thrown out of balance. Pharaoh's just asked, who is the Lord? And God's like, let me send you on my 10-plague correspondence course. The first two plagues have to do with the Nile River. Nile turns to blood, infestation of frogs. Next four plagues has to do with, that, that, that's all, by the way, the Nile River. Next floor have to do with land. Gnats, flies, death of livestock, boils. The last four have to do with the sky. Hail, locust, darkness, death of the firstborn coming from the sky. Every one of these plagues was revealing the powerlessness of all the Egyptian gods. There was a god of the Nile. There was a god of the frogs. There was a god of the dirt of the earth, which became the gnats. There's a god of the flies. Gods associated with livestock. God associated with epidemics and healing, boils. Gods of the atmosphere, weather, sky. There was a god who protected them from locusts, a god of the sun. And then Pharaoh was seen as the god of the flesh who protected human beings. Through all these plagues, God is showing I'm the one with all the authority here. I control the Nile. I control the skies. I'm over the land. Not the gods of Egypt. Not Pharaoh. God's giving them sign language. He's giving Pharaoh and all of Egypt, Egypt a crash course in his sovereignty and showing how futile their gods are. But the Egyptians aren't the only one taking the crash course. The Israelites are too. Because check this out, for 400 years, 
the Israelites have been slaves in Egypt. And when you're a slave in Egypt and you're watching Egypt winning for 400 years under the Egyptian gods, the Egyptians are winning and your life is getting worse. The Egyptian gods seem more powerful than the God of your ancestors, than your God. And Egypt's got 400 years of winning their way, under their gods. You know what? It's easy to slide into putting your trust into the gods of your surrounding culture that you live in. A while back, I was in a conversation with someone who was transparent enough to admit, after growing up in church, he just went ahead and admitted to me, Chris, I don't understand why we should let somebody invisible who we've never seen have such a say in how we live our lives. He was just being honest. He was in essence asking, who is the Lord that I should obey him? And he was wrestling with this because there are other gods in the 21st century that are more appealing to this person and even to a lot of us at times. And sometimes we as the people of God can slide into believing and aligning our lives more with the gods of the culture that surround us than the one true living God. This is why sometimes our deliverance involves us being immersed in circumstances that expose the powerlessness of other gods that we're tempted to put our trust in. I know that's a long sentence, but I want you to lock in on it. That's why it's on the screen. That my deliverance involves me being immersed from time to time in circumstances that expose the powerlessness of other gods that I'm tempted to put my trust in. Let me tell you what I mean. There have been times I've been in conversations with an addict before where the addict is explaining, here is why I am addicted because there is a pull, there is an escape, there is a fun, there is a relief in being high. It has a power for a little bit. The problem is when the high ends, the ramifications just ripple effect into the person's life to where they're not able to function academically, vocationally, relationally. The thing they cling to for their security, the thing they cling to for their coping mechanism for life doesn't have the power they think it does because it just buries them further and further into a trajectory of chaos when the high wears off. That's just one example. Put money in its place. Put jumping from one relationship to another in its place. There's all kinds of gods in our culture that we look to for relief for escape, for deliverance. And sometimes your only way to be delivered through them is to live life long enough underneath them for you to find out they don't have the power to free you like they think. In fact, they're complicating your life and making it worse. So God tells Moses and the people early on, before all this starts, before the plague start, Exodus 6, he says to Moses, therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people. I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. Watch that. It's not just about teaching the Egyptians who he is. It's about teaching his own people who he is. Then you will know I am the Lord God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. Five different times God says, I will do this, I will do this, I will do this. And then he says, then you will know I am the Lord your God who brought you out. Why does God take them this route? Because he wants them to understand that when they finally go free, it won't be because it was Pharaoh's decision. Nobody else is going to get the credit for this. Sometimes God does things in your life in such a way so that you will know there was no other way those things could have happened but through him. 
Sometimes you go through plagues. Sometimes he takes you the long way so that you will know in the end that the only way your deliverance happened was through him. This theme continues all the way through the parting of the Red Sea and the final destruction of Egypt. In fact, Israel has no doubt by the time everything is said and done that it's only through God that their deliverance came. If the plagues didn't convince them that, staring at the Red Sea with the Egyptian army closing in on them would with the sea parts and they cross it on dry ground and then they watch it collapse on the Egyptians. One little boy one time was reading on a park bench the story of the parting of the Red Sea. A guy was sitting next to him and said, what you reading? I'm reading the story of the parting of the Red Sea. Like I said, you don't really believe that. You know, archaeologists and historians have come along and they've proven that the Red Sea during that particular period of time probably wasn't more than a foot deep in certain parts. The boy said, that's even more amazing. God drowned the entire Egyptian army. (laughs) In water a foot deep. There's an interesting little story, by the way, in the story of the Red Sea. Interesting little detail. Do you remember when Moses first approached Pharaoh and Pharaoh said, perform a miracle as a way of saying, justify yourself why I should even listen to you. And Moses does what God told him to do. He takes a staff, he throws it on the ground and you have the scene where he throws the staff on the ground and whoosh, it's transformed into a snake. Pharaoh calls his magicians in. They throw their staffs down and all of them become snakes. Do you remember what happens next? Moses' snake swallows up all the other snakes. Now check this out. Do you realize that that Hebrew word for swallow, the only other time it shows up in the Old Testament is eight chapters later in Exodus 14 when the Red Sea is described as swallowing the entire Egyptian army. Listen to me very closely. It was like God was saying to Pharaoh, we end as we began. Class dismissed. But of course, God's own people are prone to forget the lesson. They still struggle to trust God at times with their deliverance even after the plagues in the Red Sea. In fact, you get to the end of our reading and it isn't long before they're mad at Moses for being out in the wilderness. And they ask the question, is the Lord among us or not? And that's the question we'll pick back up next week because they're gonna keep asking it over and over and over because we are forgetful people, aren't we? By the way, it's interesting how the Lord uses water in the whole reading this past week. Watch this. He uses water to save Moses. Moses' name is for being drawn up out of the water. And then he uses water to save all of Israel. In fact, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, he calls what happens at the Red Sea the baptism of Moses. That they are marked as God's people when they get to the other end of the Red Sea and it collapses on Egypt once and for all. I I don't know how many of you realize this, but the whole story of Christian baptism in the New Testament is actually rooted in the story of water in the Old Testament and what God does with water in the story of saving his people. With Noah and the flood, God uses water to judge the sinful condition of the earth And to raise up a new creation earth and a new creation people. In the story of the deliverance from Egyptian bondage, God is using water to deliver people from slavery. One of the stories you're telling in your baptism is you're telling the story that it's in Yeshua, in Jesus, that I move from an old creation to a new creation, that I move from bondage to freedom. That's the story you're telling in many respects. 
And speaking of Jesus, since we're all Jesus' followers, let me close by asking this. Where is Jesus in all of this? That's a question that you need to keep asking because you're reading a lot of very wild stuff right now. It's interesting how much of Exodus actually winds up in the background of Jesus' teaching and ministry. You'll actually come to understand Jesus more the more you read Exodus. For instance, his last supper with his disciples, the night before he dies, that's actually a Passover meal. And you read the story of the first Passover meal in, in Exodus 12 this past week. Jesus is leading an exodus of his own, only this time he's leading an exodus of all of us out of bondage to sin, to ourselves, to Satan, amen? Now here's the deal, here's where it gets good. Some ancient rabbis in the day of Jesus believed that when the Messiah showed up, he'd bring about plagues, the plagues you see in Exodus, he'd bring about the plagues on the Roman Empire. They were hoping that would happen. But when Jesus shows up, that doesn't happen. He still has displays of authority, but he's not unraveling creation the way it was done in Exodus. Something different is going on. It's almost the reverse form of the plagues. Watch this. When Jesus returns in the Gospels, when he comes in the Gospels, he, he does some signs himself, only instead of making water drinkable, he can, turns it into wine. Or instead of making water undrinkable, he turns it into wine. Instead of dust being turned into gnats, he takes the dust and he makes a mud pact and heals a man. Instead of boils developing on people's skin, he heals leprosy. Instead of locusts destroying everything there is to eat, he multiplies bread. Instead of bringing about darkness upon all those who see, he heals the blind. Instead of the firstborn of every Roman dying, the firstborn of every Jew dying, he, the firstborn, lays down his life. Instead of peace, people facing a judgment upon his arrival, he takes the judgment upon himself. He becomes the Passover lamb that all of us might find deliverance under his blood. It's almost like Jesus is undoing all the plagues. He's putting creation back together. He's putting us all back together while he allows himself to be torn apart for a time on the cross. And if anything, he's the one who endures the plagues. His side opens up and blood mixed with water comes pouring out. He's thirsty. He has nothing to drink. The gathering of gnats and flies around his flesh. Judgment from above as darkness falls upon him in broad daylight. And finally he dies as a criminal slave in bondage to the Roman Empire so that all of us might be freed ourselves. Here's the deal. It's not just his power that makes you want to follow him. It's his love. That's why the cross is the greatest sign language I know. He's leading an exodus. And it gives a whole new meaning to that line from Exodus 6.6 6 that we read this past week. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. Guess what? It's through his outstretched arms he redeems us all. And I don't know what it is that you need an exodus from these days. But I know who it's through. You know, they ate the Passover meal like they were about to go on the run, if you remember. Do you remember? They, they were to eat it with their cloaks tucked in. They were to eat it with everything packed. They were literally to eat and run, basically. They were to eat and prepare to move because it was time to walk out their freedom. And every time we take communion, I pray you realize that you're doing this as a way of saying, I can walk out my freedom. I can make a move. I don't have to stay here in bondage. I can move under the leadership of the one who's leading the ultimate exodus. He's the I am. For everything you're not, he's the I am. His righteousness, his spirit, his holiness, his leading, his purity. He's the I am for everything I'm not.
And this is the gospel according to Jesus. I wanna invite you to go ahead and take what you have for communion with you. And I'll just step aside and again, allow you a couple moments to consider what it is the Spirit of God is saying to you right now. Lord, as we take bread and as we take cup right now, we give you thanks. Because of you, Jesus, there is a Passover from judgment to a new beginning, from judgment to being able to walk out our freedom. And we are so grateful for you, the true Passover lamb, you, greater than Moses, you, who has not left us in bondage. And it's through you we find our way to a new beginning and to a fresh start as your person, as your people, under your blood. We bless your name. I pray for my brothers and sisters, my friends, everyone in my hearing in this room or at home or in a vehicle or in their office, wherever they might be hearing the sound of my voice. Lord, we ask that you will immerse us in the reality of the futility of other gods. Because there are times when we feel like they are more real than you are. And we long to be delivered from such an illusion. Even though the journey might be difficult, it's worth it. For you are the great I am, and we have no more time to be wasted pursuing pretend gods. We thank you for not giving up on us, and we bless your name through Christ.
we worship you. And we are grateful that you have defeated death. You have defeated the grave. Not so that we can just look forward to heaven, but so that we can live life abundantly now. God, what a privilege it is to join with the angels and saints in bowing down before you. God, make our worship before you pure and holy. We long to worship you, God. Thank you for creating us with your breath that gets to praise you. Stop working, you never stop, you never stop working. Even 